warmly welcome you to the 10th urban talk by the Institute of Urban Designers. These are a series of monthly forums on the topic of urban design and future challenges in urban living. Previously, we have had eminent speakers from India, China, Bangladesh, Canada, Nepal, Pakistan, and Hong Kong giving us the valuable insight into urban design interventions that were carried out and possible way forward in their countries. In recent months, due to the effects of global warming, we have seen entire villages uprooted and raging wildfires around the world. Therefore, today's topic, planning for climate resilience and urban design perspective is most timely and appropriate. To introduce today's topic and to make the welcome speech, I now invite the founding member and the president of the Sri Lanka uh, uh, Institute of Urban Designers and fellow member of SLIA, Dr. Janaka Vijay Sundara. Over to you, Dr. Janaka Vijay Sundara. Um, thank you, Madhumali. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening uh, to all of you uh, to the 10th session, Urban Talks webinar series organized by the Institute of Urban Designers in Sri Lanka, together with the Center for Cities, University of Morotua. Um, so um, on behalf of the council, as well as the members of the Institute and the organizers of this forum, uh, I am pleased to uh, welcome all of you uh, today evening uh, for this monthly urban forum. So um, this time we have a speaker, from Australia, uh, architect Amitabh Shaudhari, uh, who became a friend of us uh, since some months now. And uh, so uh, Amitabh, welcome to Urban Talk. Uh, and we really appreciate your uh, cooperation as well as assistance uh, in, in other ways as well, in many ways that academic works as well. Uh, so, the topic, as you already know, is about the climate change, uh, which is not a, a very new topic. We know that since more than a decade or maybe two decades of time, we had been uh, talking about this. Uh, and uh, however, it is also interesting to see that still the, uh, the importance uh, is uh, to this area, climate change and also urban living, or urban planning, urban development, uh, is uh, being addressed by many ways in many programs. Uh, I'm, I know that you all know that there are still a lot of um, programs in different continents, uh, even supported by uh, these uh, the various institutions as well as governments uh, to make sure that we are uh, sort of uh, following, we are, we are uh, in fact adhering to the, uh, the theme of uh, this uh, very important theme. Uh, and also we know that uh, the climate change perhaps, not very sure that, but we know that some stories from our ancient times, even some religious stories like Buddhist stories where droughts have come in certain parts of the uh, world, possibly India and so on. Uh, these stories are well uh, explained. Uh, but it may be, there may be a natural process as well. But at the same time, how much urban planners, urban designers, architects, landscape architects, engineers, uh, you know, contributing to this um, issue as well as contributing to uh, overcome this issue is something that uh, it is important for us to look at even at the later stages of this uh, theme uh, has initiated uh, from the beginning. So uh, in Sri Lanka too, that uh, even you know some some days before that we had some uh, uh, slices and uh, the rain and so on, flooding always happen. Uh, but is it really due to the climatic change, climate change, or is it something? Uh, more than the nature uh, nature pro, uh, process, but it is 
uh, accelerated though it is caused by the our way of living and our way of uh, developing our living environments so uh, in this context uh, uh, you know basically how we feel that is that you know we our, our cities are much much now warm and uh, heavy rain flooding uh, air quality is bad you know in some cities that we know uh, even uh, the, 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 uh, the flights are cancelled due to the uh, bad visibility and so on due to the dust and so on especially we know that in india uh, in, in delhi and so on we experience those and then indo climatic situations uh, how much uh, material uh, is impacting on these the material we use uh, for the building construction uh, outdoor um, landscaping uh, and uh, also these uh, various uh, uh, elements that we bring into the public space and water energy traffic has made a huge impact on this day by day with the smog as well as the uh, heat generated so um atmos atmos atmospheric and climate science urban design and planning building design and architect so i think we are somewhere in between that the topic uh, place today uh, not much going into uh, you know typical architectural solutions but uh, public realm uh creation of public realm as managing of that may be the subject area and also when you go into different aspect of that in terms of the uh, public space uh you know various um how the clim climate change has uh, impacted on that and then how as a whole linked thing that various urban flooding linked to the storm water management plan and then uh, infrastructure uh, plan uh, so um, um so in this way um i would like to uh, sort of present you the program which is all given to you um and um, i'm thanking again uh, speaker today amitabh choudhury uh, so he's a uh, is a member of planning street of australia as well as an architect and also he is uh, mostly teaching at the uh, university of uh, uh, new south wales sydney uh, and also i thank the moderators for today's to this discussion uh, architect urban designer planner pl silva uh, and also uh, landscape architect hester basnaik for accepting our invitations and coming forward Uh, to present here uh, as uh, service uh, even as moderators at the discussion uh, so basically we have about 55 minutes of speech by uh, our speaker and after that the forum is open uh, first to ask at least two questions from the moderators to the speaker and after that we can take up your questions mostly you can uh, text uh, to our text box and uh, we take the questions accordingly uh, so um, i think uh, again uh, welcome all of you thank you for your presence and i hand over uh, to madhumali madhumali you can go ahead with the rest of the program thank you thank you sir uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker Today's speaker, Amitabh Shaudhary, has over twenty years of experience in built environment in Australia, Asia Pacific, and South Asia. He has been involved in large scale projects in Australia, China, India, Fiji, and Philippines. Some of these are master plans for new cities, urban renewal projects, and transit oriented developments. He is an external faculty member of the University of New South Wales, Sydney. and is currently the design team leader in the city of Parramatta New South Wales Australia a registered member of the council of architecture india and a member of the planning institute of australia i now invite architect amitabh choudhury to speak on today's topic over to you sir 
Uh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Vijay Sundara. Uh, thank, thank you uh, to uh, the moderators, uh, 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 the Nana Architect uh, and Nana Pia Silva, as well as the Nana Architect, Hester uh, uh, Basanake. Uh, for, uh, for inviting me to speak, it's a privilege. And, uh, Thank, Thank you, you Madam Ali. Uh, I, before, before I start, I uh, will namaste and a good, good day, day from Sydney, Australia. Australia. It's quite, quite late, late at night, night here, here, so if I, I tend, tend to be a bit woozy, woozy you know why. <laughs> but, but I really, really look forward, forward to giving this talk, talk to you. Uh, and uh, thanks, thanks for the kind introduction. It, it makes me sound a lot more important, important than what, what I really am. am. What, what I'd like, like to do today is really have a conversation. Uh, my talk really, really would be more conversation stuff. I'm happy, happy to take questions at the end, but, but it is, I just, just would like to start, start saying that I'm not a climate scientist. Uh, I have worked as an urban designer, uh, both in the private and the public sector. So my roles are both with respect to active design as well as the review and governance. And increasingly, we found that uh, climate change and climate resilience is coming in the conversation again and again. So today's uh, talk, uh, what I hope to do is actually bring in the gamut of issues that I've encountered, especially in the last decade. And uh, so maybe at the end of it, it might give a certain kit of us on how to approach a problem and probably a pragmatic way forward. Uh, a lot of the content that I'm showing does not have figures and numbers, but it is more about conceptual issues and on how to approach the, the aspect of climate resilience and something that is intrinsic in urban design uh, and design in general. So without further ado, I'll just uh, share my screen, just bear with me. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. As I mentioned, it's going to be uh, a more casual form of a talk. Uh, I hope to go ahead and give you a perspective of uh, my experience dealing with climate resilience, especially over the last decade. I've already been introduced, but just wanted to mention that I have had a smattering of experience uh, in in, in India, in Australia, and also some professional experience in China. Uh, and then I moved from private sector to public sector in, and in review and governance, mainly in urban design, in an urban design capacity. And uh, that has given me a unique perspective from both sides. And what I hope to share with you is where the often the dilemma arises, who's going to do it, uh, how do we do it, uh, et cetera. And uh, also something I encourage in uh, the students I teach and for them to think outside the box, especially when it comes to dealing with aspects of flooding and uh, heat island effects, et cetera. So these are the key themes uh, in my talk today. I will briefly touch on the IPCC report 2021, the findings very briefly and then move on to aspects of environmental comfort, the importance of mapping and analysis, with a small foray, foray into my, uh, for want of a better word, hometown in India, in, in Calcutta, and the experience that they have faced with respect to all matters, water and drainage, et cetera. And uh, then uh, delve into some aspects of urban infrastructure and resilience and look at measures from climate change resilience. What are the tools that we have at hand in order to be better prepared for the years to come? And lastly, a very quick, uh, pragmatic uh, look at how do you go and accommodate these aspects in a project scope or brief? Very, very briefly. So the IPCC report 2021 in very brief summary says four key things that humans are responsible for climate change. Global warming would likely increase by 1.5 degrees centigrade by 20, 2030, based on a current trajectory. The effects of rising temperature would include rising sea levels, polar ice cap melt, longer fire seasons, and worse droughts. 
And if we continue with the business as usual, it is unlikely that the world will be able to stop warming at 1.5 degrees centigrade, which was the target. I've included some links below based on where, uh, I, you know, where, where I got my sources. As I said, I'm not a climate scientist, but these four elements have pretty much structured the, the theme of this talk. First is urban heat island. And uh, just give me a minute. Climate change will worsen the heat island effect uh, in which will form radiates and increases ambient heat. Climate change will worsen natural disasters like drought. Heavy rainfall events will cause flooding that get more frequent and worse as the temperature rises. And lastly, fires are projected to get worse and more frequent due to climate change. Now, with all that uh, news, uh, I think what, you know, I'd like to go and sort of bring the perspective of the architectural education I received last century, end of last century, where the focus on climate was really about environmental comfort and more specifically the environmental comfort within a dwelling or a building or a courtyard. Uh, rarely did we think about the broader impact of how does the whole city get affected? How does the street get affected? And uh, this whole idea of looking at a bigger, larger scale of climate impact was not quite the focus. Uh, it didn't, didn't mean that we didn't care. We talked about saving Amazon forests, etc. but that was at a larger scale. It is for the scientists. It is for someone else to do it. And uh, I think what I'd, you know, I'd like to say, yes, we started off where health and quality of life, safety from natural elements, shade in summer, sun in winter, impacts of wind, noise, and air quality was the primary focus. The, the architecture of the well tempered environment was something that really took front and center in terms of the environmental comfort aspects. But increasingly, even on a day to day, uh, aspect of doing business, heat island effect is coming up in the conversation. Maintenance and life cycle, environmental impacts are coming up. How long will it be there? How much is it going to cost? What is the impact of a lot of these uh, issues? You know, is it going to be something affordable in the future? Should we look at natural ventilation? The pandemic, of course, has thrown a spanner in the works and made things worse in one sense because, uh, you know, we can't think of a condition probably have norm how do we ventilate the indoor spaces if this is to continue for say you know even the next five years in some form or the other so talking about environmental comfort in terms of at least the public domain and outdoor spaces i'd like to go ahead and talk about one of the most significant uh streets where that has been put front and center. It is given the pride of place where the pedestrian is in the center of the street. These sections are from by Alan Jacobs and Great Streets. And if you can see the diagrams, it is pretty much, uh, you know, going ahead and looking at the pedestrian in the center. It is adequately shaded by large canopy trees, effectively created a shared, shaded pleasant environment in Barcelona where the temperature can go up to 40 degrees often, if not more. So this whole idea of designing for climate that goes ahead and also melts in the, the local tradition of the Paseo or people walking and promenading. And there's a variety of users that you can see at the, the view at ground level. And if you look at it, it's a very defined space, myriad activities, outdoor dining, shade and also creating this place, which is very desirable for pedestrians. It also has vehicles. It also, you can catch a cab out there. There's park out, parking for motorcycles, etc., and a very, very successful space. Even as we move to the further end of the Ramla, it's where it becomes less, uh, you know, less of active dining, but it's still a very comfortable place, still an opportunity to, for seating, street lighting, canopy trees, etc. And I think that should be the focus of making places that are resilient, that are durable, that go ahead and often depend on fundamental things like tree canopy to shade them. 
And uh, this is a slide from Burke Street in the city of Sydney, again, where uh, a very concerted effort has been made to create a pleasant shaded walking environment. Sydney temperatures can also go up very high, 40 degrees or so in summer, of late it's touching 45 in the art of the city. And having this ability to go ahead and have that large canopy trees, Sydney has a tradition of a lot of overhead wires, which tend to go ahead and damage trees because the energy company comes and gives the trees a haircut every now and then, and the canopy gets reduced. But if that is undergrounded, so this whole effort of understanding how do you go ahead and encourage this tree canopy, what are the key measures you need to put in, basically undergrounding wire can canopies, making sure that the root uh, roots of these trees are not getting scorched by hot concrete around them, making it pleasant for, you know, thinking from the tree's point of view so that they actually have the ability to grow to maturity and, and have a large canopy. Uh, the next example, as I said, I'm moving all around the globe, uh, pretty much like the way I have. Uh, this is looking at a step well, uh, it's a medieval step well. Uh, in in what they call Bayhari in Nidav, in Asarwa, close to Andabad, where I had my undergraduate degree. Now, a step well was often made you know, in times of droughts, where the, the ruling monarch would go ahead and get funding to provide employment, as well as create water security, so people would excavate and make it. But this feature, if you look at the plan in the section, makes a celebration of one, it is very, very uh, in tune with climatic requirements. It uses uh, basically the excavation of the earth, the cool, coolness within the earth as creating a very pleasant, pleasant microclimate. And it also makes a celebration of going and gathering water. And in the next slide, you'll see this is the quality of the space within. Now, that has several dimensions. One, it is looking at drought, it is looking at the social and this financial distress going on. It is about economic planning, going ahead and investing in future infrastructure, and then working with climate to create a very pleasant environment, and which has a legacy has been there for hundreds of years. So I think in terms of climate change right now, we are all you know, in panic mode, what do we do? But these things possibly have happened before, not with the level of frequency we have had, but to think about creating that capacity in the future, how do we go ahead and use our tools as built environment specialists to create these opportunities for legacy projects and how do we improve climate as a result and also provide the basic need in this case water. And also create opportunities for environmental comfort in cities, this is Bailey Park, New York City, very, very famous park creates a little pocket of ref refuge in this extremely dense environment in Manhattan by providing the sound of falling water, this tree canopy, this green walls and ivy on both sides, and lots of free seating for people to go, go ahead and you know, grab a lunch, or you can bring your own uh, a book to read or some uh, that gives you a little bit of uh, respite from that intensity. It's also climatically a, a, a pleasant place to be in. It's shaded in summer or, or does get a little bit of sun in winter. These are the aspects that you have uh next place again i'm going back to barcelona this is the plaza real uh it's the main square in the old part of town 55 meters by 80 meters and if you look at the scale of it it's around three times as wide as it is high effectively a cool air tank and for the fairly hot dry climate of barcelona works very effective as both in the day and night uh, allows a myriad amount of uses, is designed for climate, but is also versatile in other aspects of it. So I don't think that we can divorce climate from every other aspect that we are doing. Life will go on. And I think it's best to go ahead and rather than taking saying how do we go and deal with climate? How do you deal with everything else where climate is prioritized? And as I am using traditional examples, these are ways people have gone ahead and designed the spaces very, very effectively. So looking and to tradition, as well as looking at modern science and combining the two would possibly be the way to go ahead. And the other aspect is we are 
it's often looking at measures. How do you create this thing? One is obviously doing the most obvious, providing opportunities for people to sit in comfortable places, uh, providing trees, providing a patch of grass, providing deep soil for the trees to grow in, and making sure the materials and paving, et cetera, that you use are uh, not uh, you know, adding to the heat island effect, using cool materials where possible. And there is a lot of new uh, research uh, and science on the materiality that we can use that does not affect, effectively reduces that heat gain uh, on, on these areas. And if you notice, most of my talks seem to be about heat gain. It is quite relevant in South Asia, as well as in places like Australia. And I think also looking at opportunities, if you look at the right hand side of the page, this is the Darling Water Water Fountain, a water play area. The building at the back is uh, the Commonwealth Bank headquarters and the, the, the park in front is, uh, is effectively a uh, developer contribution. So there's a major headquarter of a bank which has chosen not to go high rise, but made a very long, low slung building instead. It's eight to 10 stories. And as a result, the developer contribution was a very, very high order park. So you have 200 meters of retail on the ground floor, parents going and grabbing a coffee, looking at children supervising their play around, and it is really top of the notch and very, very popular in summers. So again, planning for how do you go ahead and create this opportunity for people to cool off. The other slide I'm showing you, going back to I'm the bird, this is looking at how traditionally this has been dealt with. This is contrasting urban form, to the right hand side of the page is Old City of Ahmedabad, which is essentially the organic creative medieval form with uh, narrow streets and courtyard dwellings and mutual shading and passive energy techniques. And to the east is the detached bungalow type, again, which looks at adequate separation between the things so that the building can effectively lose any heated gains and there's a lot of foliage and tree canopy to go ahead and address the impacts of the same climate on both sides. So these are two very different ways of dealing with climate, both effective. One, of course, has a very different character to the other one. And this has, as I said, there are cues that we can pick up what tradition has given us. But one thing we realize that as Ahmedabad is modernizing, most of the development that's happening is on the western part of Ahmedabad. And and I'll show you a few slides after uh, what the challenges are. Again, this comes back to, as I mentioned, um, my architectural training and Otto Koenigsberg, a man of tropical housing, housing and building, uh, was pretty much a seminal text by which we did our environmental science. Now, Otto Koenigsberg was an architect, climate scientist of sorts, who basically fled Hitler's occupied Europe and sought refuge in India in Mysore, and he became the chief architect to the body of Mysore. And he went ahead and carried on a lot of the research while during the war years. And he later on became the director of housing in, in India and used a lot of his findings to go ahead and inform this book, which has become sort of the seminal text across, used across East Africa. South Asia, Southeast Asia, Northern Australia in terms of tropical housing. And I think it is very important to consider this, especially if you're looking at a modest scale of building, it does have a lot of value. But, and this kind of thinking actually informed a lot of the development. This, uh, I've shown you a few slides all by B.V. Doshi, the principal prize winning architect. Uh, the first is the SEPT um, campus, SEPT University campus in Ahmedabad. The second is the Institute of Indology, stones throw away from the university. The second is the office administration building of SEPT. But all of them looked at how you can go ahead and have these passive solar uh, designs, passive energy designs, very thick masonry walls, uh, use of north lights for the stu uh, design studios going ahead and have opportunity for opening out and having cooling breezes when the time was appropriate, creating this cool shaded spaces within using partially excavated basements to basically have cool chambers where you could go ahead and have certain other uses, whether it's an auditorium or a library. 
And these all worked quite well, but now the challenge of the development is different. There's a lot of curtain walling, there's a lot of larger floor plate buildings coming up. Now, the challenge is how do we go ahead and make that transition from those low slung buildings that had passive energy designs into something like this, which obviously needs air conditioning. You cannot go ahead and have a, you know, naturally lit and ventilated and heated or cooled uh, building of this nature because the whole brief is different. And, and there's nothing wrong with development because this is the, the order of the day, but how do you go and deal with it when everything is of this nature? We are looking at a lot of, uh, you know, heating, ventilation, HVAC systems, radiating heat out, buildings are not spaced very far apart, heat gain from one is going to the other and the whole city is heating up. So these are the challenges that we need to look at. And then there's a look, a looking at the broader realm of public space, in this case, the Sabarmati Riverfront. Uh, the Sabarmati was a seasonal river, it would fill up during the monsoon, then it would be a dry river bed for most of the year. But when the first rains would come, everybody would go ahead onto that bridge, near a bridge you can see in the distance, and basically take the breeze. Everyone park the scooters, go out there, and that was a very rare opportunity. So in one sense, it did address that need for this place where people could go and view the water and have some cooling breezes. And so they built a weir across, but sometimes when you are making these initiatives, uh, probably the environmental impacts are not assessed as thoroughly as they should. So right now it's an asset, the city has got a river front, but there are some issues in terms of, you know, the, you know, how do you deal with you know, algal blooms, how do you deal with, you know, a heat event and a lot of fish die. And these are something that needs to be considered up ahead in the any kind of design brief. Uh, There's something we learn in one sense, it is very successful because of the amount of tree canopy that has been provided. So it does create a lot of shade and opportunity for people to use it. Uh, there are few, very few spaces of that nature in the city. So this gives a release, but always along with that, you, know, you might create a positive attribute, but look at the environmental impact. So this has to go hand in hand. So coming to the next theme of mapping and analysis, I'll start off with a few, you know, approach of how in you know being a part of city of Parramatta, what would we normally do in terms of uh, analysis? Uh, right now, unfortunately, a lot of the information that is there in terms of GI systems, etc., are not open source, and I think that would be the first start. When everybody has access to that information, it's easier for you to go ahead and do your analysis. If it remains in the repository of government or a few organizations and they don't talk to each other, your analysis gets flawed. So I think uh, the first thing, of course, I'm just going to the key themes. Uh, one is to look at storm drainage, include riparian corridors, identifying ecologically sensitive lands, including wetlands, flooding, choke points, and high hydraulic hazards, tree canopy, endemic vegetation, and grasslands, and soil landscape, chemistry, and geotechnics, fire hazard risk, and lastly, the importance of open source data. Look, a lot of this would have been covered by a McCargan analysis, uh, but I think one of the things I found in my experience that that level of analysis often is not conducted on projects with a very short time frame. If you have the luxury of that happening in the new greenfield site and new city being rolled out, well and fine. So sometimes you need this information handy. So if that level of information has already been undertaken and shared with the public, uh, that is very useful because it saves them a lot of time and expense. I think that kind of information may be made available to people saying, you know, this is based on secondary sources and you have to do your due diligence. But the more information that is made available, and this can only be done at the level of the state or the local government, very few people have the ability to undertake this on, on a private level. So I think that level of making open source data is very important and that a regular funding is needed to make sure that that analysis is updated and available. So coming to it, this is a storm drainage. It's a basically a contour mapping as well as where the creek lines are and identification of riparian corridors. 
Sydney Water has certain standards in terms of what, how wide the riparian corridor should be. And this is a, just an understanding of where does basically water flow down to the Parramatta River creeks. Uh, if you see around here is the, the headland of, uh, sorry, the, the origin of Parramatta River goes down and joins Sydney Harbour for, uh, to the east. But along with it are a whole system of creeks which uh, uh, go through often nature reserves and uh, pretty much vegetated areas, which could become natural assets. Some of them are more sensitive, so not appropriate to be used for active users. Others could be, you know, the detention basins, et cetera, to get a good understanding of where water goes and where is a potential risk, et cetera. The next would be, as I mentioned, flood. Where is flood? This is uh, the ones in uh, the, Dark blue is the one in 100 year level flood, which in New South Wales is pretty much so half a meter above the one in 100 year flood is legislated. So, any kind of development that you're providing, so, and I'll come to it in more detail later on. But this information often right now is available. You come in with an application, you put in an application, and the the DA, the DA, the flood engineer give you your little bit, okay, this is what you have to respond to. So everyone takes off their little information and they are not hesitant, they're hesitant to go and provide this information because this is a dynamic modeling. And they feel if they give you something that they will be held culpable. So I think sometimes that is a hindrance. I think it is important to share that information, but with the caveat that you have to do your own due diligence. But this gives me a good idea, idea of where the flooding is, where should I not locate all the sensitive users, et cetera. Uh, I will try to share this video, but I don't know whether the sound will be effective or not. Sometimes I, it has been an issue, just bear with me. Let me know if you can't. Uh, yeah. Most major floods in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley begin with high rainfall during east coast lows. But why are floods here so large and deep? What makes this valley have one of the highest flood dangers in all Australia? Five major tributaries act like taps, pouring water into the valley during a flood. While every flood is different, the Warragamba River contributed up to 70% of the water in major floods that happened in the past 60 years. The other tributaries typically make smaller contributions. All this water needs to get to the sea, but natural choke points where the river narrows slows the flow in this valley. We call this the bathtub effect, where water backs up and starts filling the floodplain because there is only one plug hole letting water out. Because water is confined in this small valley at Wallachia, the worst flood here reached depths around 20 metres above normal river levels. Further downstream, the floodplain at Penrith and Emu Plains is created by the next choke point. Because Penrith has naturally high river banks, which hold the river back, low-lying areas around Emu Plains and Peachtree Creek are affected first. However, extreme floods in the past have reached as far east as Woodruff Street in Penrith, where the river was 12 metres above normal levels. Further downstream, the next choke point is caused by a series of gorges starting at Sackville. Because the Richmond-Windsor floodplain is relatively flat and wide, floodwaters spread quickly across a vast area. In the worst flood on record, here the river reached 19 metres above its normal level. Floodwaters back up into creeks in the valley and flood islands form as floodwaters rise. 
It's this bathtub effect that makes floods in the Hawkesbury Nepean so devastating. This is why it's important to respond when you're told to evacuate. The last major flood was in 1990. It will flood again in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley. The risk is real. Do you know your flood risk? Okay, I'll go back to my presentation right now. Okay, uh, the next aspect is high hydraulic hazard. Again, uh, fast moving water that would put life and lift limb at risk to identify where they are. And having a collective view is good. Otherwise, it's very difficult to go and plan cities if you are just getting piecemeal data. So that's a comprehensive set of data that is, is ideally pre-analyzed so that you can go ahead and make your own conclusion is important. The next is uh, looking at tree canopy cover. Uh, if there are any uh, databases that give you where the tree canopy cover is so that you have some targets. If you are talking of increasing tree canopy cover in a particular precinct, you already have the data. Therefore, you can start off. This is our start, uh, the point right now. And in the future, you can go ahead and measure it and to inform people as you go that this is where we are at and how we are progressing if you're trying to increase tree canopy and that's part of the agenda. Looking at uh, mapping of endemic vegetation and grasslands, increasingly it's apparent that grassland ecologies are as important as forest ecologies and uh, making sure where these natural assets are and if there is something that is to be acknowledged. Uh, incidentally, uh, if you can see my arrow, this area was one of the most contaminated parts of Parramatta. It has hexavalent chromium, it has hydrocarbons, it has possibly asbestos fill, and effectively, because of its contaminated nature, it was sort of cordoned off, no, uh, no access allowed. And as a result, because it was undisturbed, a lot of green, gold and green bell frogs with the endangered fauna came ahead and made a roost there. So sometimes, Nature has its own way of dealing with things. So essentially what was considered very contaminated because it was relatively undisturbed has allowed something else to flourish. I don't know how the health of the frogs are, but generally it tends to other tensions. And the other aspects of soil landscapes, chemistry and geotechnics. Uh, as an architect, I had very little understanding of this before you know, I went into this aspect. One of the things in at least the Sydney River Basin is uh, acid sulfate soils. You have a lot of sulfites in the soil. So if you have a lot of excavation and cut and fill, what it does is exposes the sulfites in the air to oxygen. It turns into hydrogen uh, sulfuric acid, and that leaches out into river systems and kills a lot of plant and animal life in the river. So these are small measures, but it, there are legislation that goes ahead and says, map the acid sulfate, but very few people are actually conscious of why they're doing these things. And I think as a lot, if the whole design and planning community have that conversation going about why they're doing rather than a tick box approach, it would actually have uh, more engagement and understanding this is the reason why the more excavation means there is uh, effectively an uh, erosion of the quality of uh, water quality, acid rain, uh, acid, uh, acidity increases, etc. And lastly, in Australia especially, this uh, is the fire hazard mapping. This has to be done at a state level. It cannot be done at a local government uh, or private level. And as a result, uh, you have a response, a very high intensity. You'd have to have a different strategy of you know, looking at a higher uh, you know, fire rating, looking at strategies to make sure there is to deal with it. I'll go with it later when I talk about what are the strategies to cope. Okay, uh, this is a little bit of a detour on, again, I'm going back to Calcutta, uh, Kolkata as it is known right now, to looking at, you know, how this analysis is so important. And I take the example of a part of the new suburb of Calcutta, not very new, it was set up in the 60s. Uh, is pretty much built out right now. And uh, it's called Vidhanagar right now. And one of the problems is that it was done with this rationalist enthusiasm, okay, the city needs to grow. 
there are some marshlands to the east and the sit river has silted up. Let's dredge the river and put the soil in the marshland and then all our problems are solved. So as a result, it has, has some cause and effect uh, issues, but what it's brought, brought to the fore and how important water is as an element, especially in an area where the water table is very high and it is something that we have to work with rather than against. Start off with a little summary of the history of Calcutta. It was founded officially in 1990 and uh, thereafter till the, the, the first, the Sepoy Mutiny, 1857, it sort of became a major outpost, gradually growing in size. And if you notice the maps that were prepared then, all of them showed the amount of water bodies, little tanks, canals, etc which was a part of the landscape and they sort of acknowledged it because it was everywhere and it's kind of ubiquitous and it's part of the tradition i'm happy to share this uh with you the presentation should anyone be interested and one of the first acts that they did was prepare a canal that sort of was a drainage element around uh, as a half moon shape around the the river uh, the, the city the port being on the riverside, and then there was this protective moat called the Maratha ditch to pre prevent attacks from the Marathas, effectively for the moat of sorts. As one part of the civic infrastructure or urban infrastructure that they did, again, using water. The next was, uh, there was a very high rate of mortality because a lot of the European settlers were not used to the, the local climate and, uh, this was an overriding uh, issue everywhere where there was Kipling's poetry or, or uh, you know, anecdotes that you basically get of people sit, settling in there. And this is a slide of uh, the Park Street Cemetery, and that shows you the level where depth was an overwhelming, overwhelming presence uh, for the settlers in, in there. But as a result, the, a lot of effort went into setting up these commit, committees for urban improvement, looking at better drainage, and how do you uh, they identify the, the, some issues with either malaria coming from bad or perceived bad air, or uh, why is this happening? As it happens, uh, uh, Ronald Ross, the person who got the Nobel Prize for discovering the malaria virus used to practice in Calcutta. So what the effort meant was that these committees were set up to look at improved drainage, improve water management. And so by post, uh, between 1857 to 1911, which was when the, tra the capital transferred to Delhi, uh, there was a lot of infrastructure put in one was looking at uh, a canal arrangement where boats could go ahead and it became a tollway of sorts for boats. There were bridges put in. Uh, there was steam operated docks that are uh, uh, lock gates that are still functioning to this day. And the, this was put in basically to improve urban health and amenity, but water was the tying element around here. Also, the Clark scheme and the foundation of the Kolkata current sewage system was established in 1857, and to date it is pretty much holding up the fort, as it were, because it is aging infrastructure like a lot of world cities. And uh, so this is a map again of this uh, between 1857 to 1911 looking at the the part of calcutta again the number of those uh you know tanks and and water bodies have diminished but it's still there as an element and uh to the east i think it's 19 uh, it's sorry to the right of the page it is uh it is 1912 just after the capital was moved to Del uh, delhi and you can see that the city has expanded. But uh, what I like to uh, highlight to you is the northeast of the of the towns uh, of the city is still relatively vacant, mainly because that's where the the marshland or the wetlands were. So this is a slide showing the the. Of the the general post office and the main civic buildings around the tank square. This was the main uh, main square in town and Calcutta has most of its square actually occupied by water because that's effectively uh, 
the, the morphology of the town, a lot of open space has a tank in the middle. And this was the, the tank square that's still the, the central point of town. That's in, the, the general post office located there. To the bottom of the slide, you can see a, a bronze plaque commemorating the heritage of the place and reconstructing what it used to look like in its early days. It's there in, as part of Heritage Walk. And uh, to the right, you can see the, the city in 1942 and all the blue areas that you can see in salt water, et cetera. These were the wetlands to the east of the city where the water would drain either to the Hooghly River to the west or to the wetlands to the east. And uh, the next are a few slides that show how important water is for Calcutta. This is, of course, set up at the time of seafaring vessels that were the, went by the power of sail. So a lot of the ships were able to come up the river and they were relatively small and therefore could come all the way up to Calcutta. And effectively, the port was set up, uh, the, the Calcutta of the city was set up. At the back, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the Calcutta High Court. This building is a mirror copy of the town hall at Euprius in Belgium. And when the Belgian town hall was bombed in the First World War, they actually went ahead and got the plans of this to rebuild it. So it was pretty much a copy of that. It's, it's unusual how the empire and, and, its, and its effect sort of echoed all across the world. But it is about water. It is about creating these embankments and ramparts and dealing with the effect of a tidal river. Along with it was that was essentially a European construct. Then you had the aspects of Indian or, or, or tradition about the Ghats, which was the stepped embankments, which was very important for this is an, uh, something in the late 1800s, if not early 1900s. And at the rear is the Zanana Ghats, where the women used to go for bathing, to take a holy dip in the river. And this is another shot of the same. And it was all about going ahead and working with water rather than against water. And uh, it is still important. This is a slide showing the Durga Puja, where the mother goddess is immersed in the holy waters of the river every year after the festival in, in, in autumn. And this is, uh, again, the traditional construct of using water. And uh, this is the other aspect where modernity and tradition actually cross over. There's a new uh, suspension bridge across the uh, Hooghly River. And, uh, but there is a festival going on, possibly the Chakboja, which is worship of the sun god. And it is done at the river banks. And it is, it is, as I said, it's a living river, living tradition. How does climate change come in? I think it's important to acknowledge that these traditions would continue along with whatever changes are happening. So if we are planning for change, let's not just think of climate in itself, we have to look at the other dimensions that we are talking about and see how we can accommodate these things to work with climate rather than against it. This is the former tank square. Now it's matured, the trees are grown. Again, water is a pervasive element that you see everywhere. And uh, there are some symbols of empire. There's a Victoria Memorial, a related Wadian monument in marble, supposed to rival Taj Mahal. I don't know whether it does, but again, it is sitting in virtually surrounded by lakes. And uh, the two examples I'm showing, both Minto Park and South Calcutta, again, the park is pretty much, most of it is water. And a sacred pool next to some traditional shrines in Southwest Calcutta, which is, very, very much a common sight that if there is a, a shrine, it usually comes along with an associated water body. Some architects have picked up on it. Uh, Kerry Hill Architects have designed ITC Sonar Bangla and in which they celebrated this presence of water. And as you can see, it's, it's quite a pervasive element. But that right now has really been the realm of resorts and very high end development. Most of it is not as sensitive. So coming back to this whole idea of drainage, uh, the new suburb of Salt Lake was planned by Dobry Boye Toskovic, a Yugoslavian master planner who was engaged to do this new township. And he went ahead and in a very rational mode said, this is an entanglement, this is a clean sheet, and that's how I'd like to do it. 
that may be okay, but the point is it did disrupt a lot of the natural water movements. There's the aerial photograph of that precinct. And uh, these are, this is the character of the development, wide streets, large uh, canopy trees. It's not too unpleasant in certain parts, but the fact is it is built over former wetlands. And this is what, how it was planned. And they sort of executed it nearly the same way with some minor variation, except for the industrial estate, which has sort of done its own thing to the southwest of the township an aerial uh, view showing the extent of that open space and that the area that looks as the dark green patch is really where the wetlands start and this slide overlays a 1942 map with the current google map and you can see those blue areas where the wetlands were have been all reclaimed and it's effectively development but some of it is still remaining but because of that development, the water which tended to flow into the Hooghly River or the wetlands to the east were disrupted. And there, it's worse than the cloud. First of all, the water table was already high. There's an aging infrastructure. The population has grown significantly. A lot of area where the flood holding capacity has been reduced, but this has worsened it. So there are fairly common floods every now and then. A, a small downpour can often create a lot of floods and the slide to the left of the page is just from September. So it's at a very frequent event and it's happening again and again. Then aerial view of uh, Salt Lake City, as you realize it does still have the water body that I was talking about, but it is not the same as the wetland because there's been a loss of that original habitat. Now, this is a Calcutta Municipal Corporation areas. And somehow or the other, they have excluded the, the, the Hanagar area because there's a different municipality. Again, shows how the lack of uh, integration of data between two sources gives us very stymied worldviews of what really is. And the East Kolkata wetlands are the ones in the darker green. And uh, this is what it looks like. It is extensive areas and they're used for a, a pretty much fish farms. And what it has done is actually, there are a lot of uh, solid waste, refuse of the city, pretty much anything that can be dumped is used to be poured at one of these areas. So there are some environmental restrictions, but this has become a major food producing area. And not only is it important for the drainage, but it's also for the food security of that, the region. And uh, this is on the ground level, what it looks like. Some parts of it are the narrow winding ways. There's a lot of uh, people actually are employed there growing food or, or uh, rearing fish or whatever it is. And the good thing is that as a result of there's been gradual uh, understanding of this. And in 2002, it was designated as a UNESCO natural heritage element, world heritage element, but somehow it's come into people's consciousness that it is important to go ahead and acknowledge these aspects. So when you are planning for climate change, one thing is to understand it. And one thing is to have the citizenry behind these efforts. If it comes top down, usually there isn't that level of acceptance of any idea. So if people do own an idea, there is, so in one sense it's in safe hands because there has been at all level, both governmental, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has intervened, the lot of action resident, uh, uh, the action groups, as well as school children who really care about it. But whether the rest of the open wetlands or the tanks, etc., that gradually are being filled up, there are some uh, environmental protection regulations, but uh, I don't know whether it has been as successful or not. Again, coming back to the main theme of urban infrastructure and resilience, uh, this is a study by ACOM 2017 saying that climate change is going to have major impact um, on you know, urban infrastructure uh, with the increase in the magnitude and frequency of extreme weather events. So looking at urban infrastructure, this is a fairly old example. 20 years ago uh, in Korea, there was this motorway that was built over a river creek and they consciously chose to go ahead and remove that and reinstate the creek and 
it was uh, received a lot of media attention, at least in design circles, and uh, it's been uh, touted around as, okay, this is the way to go. But what it has done is created a very pleasant space. It's created flood capacity. It's created a place for people to promenade and also created an amenity and, and added to the real estate value of uh, development on either side. So it is what is seen initially as a, you know, it's a lot of pain, but it does come up with a lot of outcomes that will help uh, climate resilience. And I think this is the way of changing the way we see it and putting it into the, the design discourse and any form of lobbying that we as designers can hold uh, sway and say, you have to consider and has been delivered before. In certain cases, of course, it tends to be a little bit more complicated. In Sydney, uh, the image to the left is 2009. There was a, a, a commercial um, you know, uh, goods loading and unloading uh, facility, a port in Sydney, which was owned by the Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority, which was a different entity to the city of Sydney, the local government area. And they decided to redevelop their land. And as a part of it, the design brief was to reinstate the headland of this area and to make it what Captain Cook would have seen when he sailed into to Sydney Harbour. Now, while it's all very fine to try to recreate the past, this is the park that you see is really a car park beneath. So, uh, and effectively has been paid for by a lot of development. The city to say no behind is uh, something that effectively is a part of the development mix. So one has to be careful of what is being offered, if this is being packaged as development benefit or service to society. Uh, I don't know how that ties in with climate change, because I don't think the climate was really put first and center. I think the real estate development potential that is has to happen. But I think one has to look at what is the climatic requirements and make it distinct from any other real estate spiel that might be thrown into the mix. There is, of course, blue and green infrastructure. Now, uh, Tanner Springs Park in Portland, Oregon, is hailed as one of the best art, uh, uh, examples, looking at feasible and valuable solutions for urban areas uh, facing the challenges of climate change, like such as cloud birds and drought. So by creating a, a park that can actually be resilient enough to have occasional flooding, or can actually be a place where a lot of uh, animal life can actually go ahead and have some water as well as the trees can grow around it because it harvests the water effectively around it, may be a good way to approach. So this blue-green infrastructure is one way of having a network of uh, building up the resilience of uh, you know, working with water. I'm sorry. The other aspect is looking at urban infrastructure to prevent calamities after Cyclone uh, Sandy. Uh, New York went ahead into hyperdrive trying to go ahead and see how do you protect the city assets. And they came up with the concept of the dry, dry line and looking at uh, urban flood prevention. There was a lot of strategy in mind, whether it's a question of building berms or buffers to prevent water coming in. And they used uh, a system of uh, levees and berms and, and other mechanisms to go ahead and to stop or reduce the force of uh, tidal waves and water. The other aspect is looking at urban infrastructure, like this is Grand Project, Grand Project Paris, uh, where they went ahead and made there's a second tranche of the Grand Project Paris. One was established by President Mitterrand, and this one is Sarkozy started the next lot, looking at major urban interventions that they can deliver a lot of desired outcomes and climate change can be incorporated. This is the slide to the lower part of the, uh, the image to the lower part of the slide is uh, in Saint Denis, which is on the CN, the northern part of CN in Paris. It is a uh, an area which has a lot of problems. Urban, uh, there is a social inequity. There's been a lot of protests, etc. And there was an effort put in to create better, uh, improved outcome, not only environmentally but also socially. 
part of one of the works was to underground uh, the motorway and create an open park and link it to a system of parkways in uh, open spaces in, in the precinct, as well as the start of France, the football stadium where the World Cup was held was located in Saint-Denis. So working with social and environmental outcomes in this case. Uh, the Olympic Park again had a green theme, again showcasing environment, a former industrial uh, precinct that had a lot of contamination that needed to be addressed. So this was used using a cash injection of the Olympics, which really is a white elephant of sorts, but you can get long term outcomes delivered as a part of it. And the London Olympics did just that. Then coming to the aspect of flood resilience, uh, if you, uh, this is a project that I had undertaken 2006 and seven. This is a small uh, town north of Sydney called Raymond Terrace. Next, uh, and it is on a river and it is on a levee that protects the river, but sometimes the flood rises above the levee and there is significant flooding more than a floor you know more than three or four meters of flooding then the brief was to come up with an urban design strategy on that area the site highlighted in blue how do you go ahead and create something that's more resilient uh, they do get a two-hour flood warning and how do you plan for it and all they were to go ahead and come up with a strategy that will allow you to deliver uh, a certain amount of floor space that can actually be let otherwise if it's flooded of course people have to pay higher insurance premium so this whole idea was to make it as resilient as possible and this was some other architect had built it as per our recommendations it was quite successful the key issue in that thing in that scheme was that the a greater commercial space was built above the floodplain along the levee and anything that was below the one in hundred flood level are made flood resilient. So we didn't have any substation, transformers, lifts, etc. And if there was car parking out there, people had the two hour advance notice that they could drive out. So nothing below that flood level was, you could have a few floor stalls, etc. but in a flood event, they would be wheeled up. And that was a plan of management put in. So you can manage to work with it. Sometimes it doesn't, it's not a foolproof solution, but it is better than doing nothing. And that should be the approach. Maybe next slide. And uh, there, again, as I mentioned, this is a reactive approach. This is the Australian Federal Police building in flood impacted land. And the whole building is designed to tread lightly so that the actual footprint is minimized the way it's handled using a system of elevated massing, sensitive landscaping and earth mounded mitigation measures. Now, the next museum is the Perez Art Museum in Miami, it has a lot of valuable artwork, also subject to a lot of typhoons and storms. And these three story, very large, uh, you know, 20,000 square meter building is elevated above the floodplain and use an underground open air car parking garage. Now in Sydney, they probably would not allow that uh, air car, car parking garage because apparently garages, especially basement garages, are places where water fills up most and most casualties happen there. So, but it depends on context. Some Sometimes you can actually allow it. It's really a question of making sure that you reduce damage to life and limb. But uh, in this case, that, that was the strategy that they went ahead and located well above the floodplain. But this is a more proactive response where you use water sensitive urban design to create a system of natural uh, system by providing, you know, open space drainage patterns that are really made a part of the landscape treatment rather than hidden away. In this case, the drainage is uh, surface drainage, but it's done in a manner where it is also pleasant to look at. And also creates flood capacity where there is occasional flooding. This can actually act as the the detention basin for while the flood waters dissipate. Again, another shot of Tanner Spring uh, Park, quite resilient, can withstand occasional flooding, and also in drought can go ahead and serve as uh, 
repository. Okay. Uh, the city of the city of Helsinki uh, flood planning guide uh, has a, a, a uh, you know instruction how to deal with tidal and coastal flooding. Quite a few cities are uh, planning to do so, and I think it is important to build that resilience depending on what works for that context. And this is another development in Helsinki, the Arabian Ranta facility, the former uh, Itala ceramics work. Uh, part of that uh, ceramic work is not functioning anymore and has been repurposed into the Alto University as well as the Fiskars headquarters, there's a business park as well as a lot of residential development, which is built according to that strategy. For example, uh, anything within three meters of the high tide level uh, of coastal flooding does not have any residential uses. So it builds in that capacity. So, you know, you reduce, minimize exposure of uh, flooding in these areas. This is an event uh, where there was flooding. And if you notice in the last scheme, the water is set far back, but the water rises but they have located the building footprints where the flood is unlikely to reach them. But I'll go ahead and look at more heavy capital uh, pollution, the, the James Barrier Bridge that cost 500 million in 1984, would be probably over a billion dollars right now. But it is really something that can not be afforded everywhere across the globe. And you have to look at the impact of it. Is it really money well spent? Could it be done differently? But it, it is a solution. You know, it is a very capital intensive solution. This is Hamburg, Hafen City, Hamburg, which uh, they were looking at a new growth precinct, but had uh, flooding of up to eight meters below low tide. And so they had to come up with a strategy and this is how they chose to do it. They went ahead and looked at, there's a small section I have in the next slide, which looks at raising the, the predominant level of building well above to that the dash line is where the, the flood levels are. So, and if you see around here, most doors, these are floodgates. So when a flood rises, they can technically close and shut out the water. But again, a very technology in, intensive uh, approach may not be relevant everywhere, but relatively expensive. And also it depends on a lot of very coordinated response and it may not be the privilege in many, many circumstances where challenges are different. Uh, this is Parramatta Ferry in 2016, and just to show you the intensity of floods that happened, this is in earlier this year, the same flood, uh, the ferry uh, stopped, basically the, the river basically broke its banks, and that's the kind of uh, floodwaters you have. But going back to the thing, it is important to go ahead and make these places as resilient as we can, so that later on, the, the, the damage control is fairly modest. And also, most importantly, if the flood water is right where people are using it, they have uh, ability to escape so that they are not impacted by fast moving water. So planning for that is important, Re giving safe refuges and escape paths. And uh, this was the business as usual of flood response in Parramatta. And one of the things we noticed that first is the most obvious, the retail edges. Uh, as I mentioned before, the flood planning level plus half a meter freeboard is how we determine a flood planning level. So flood level of one in 100, so it's a meter, half a meter more, one and a half meter above the footpath is what you'd have to plan if it is, say, the one in 100 meters, one, or one meter. So what it does is physical access is impacted. The retail access is a poor street edge condition because there are very few people decide to go up, walk up one and a half meters to go and grab a cup of coffee and move on. So it becomes, it works for a certain kind of retail, not for active dining. Uh, electrical infrastructure is com com compromised. Basements, there are an issue because you have to go up to go down to cut out the water. Emergency evacuation issues, if someone has a heart attack during a flood event, how are they evacuated? Uh, there's also the cost of higher insurance premiums. So at the end of the day, that is something that will guide a lot of uh, reasoning that if you get a house that is untenanted, uh, a development that's untenanted because the insurance premiums are too much, that's where the development community say that we have to switch on and say, make it something that's resilient. So it's always important to appeal to the hip pocket as well as address commercial, uh, you know, the environmental objectives. 
This is again uh, Parramatta River earlier this year. And what we have done right now is taken working with flood concern, this work in progress, looking at some draft controls, identifying where the flood is in the city center and how do we deal with it in terms of uh, our fl flood, uh, flood response. So if that, that area in Asterix is say the flood planning level, the three or the, the one in 100 plus half a meter, how do we go ahead and make an active retail edge work? So we have said, okay, you can have a, a small area of managed inundation in the pale blue. So that's where you are going to have the temporary stuff like you know a few tables and chairs for, for dining or movable uh, equipment that you can move in case of a flood. But the main floor is flood safe, that's on the higher ground. But there are issues of accessibility uh, because then you have to allow for ramps, et cetera, for uh, wheelchairs and it gets complicated. It's not very simple to do. Uh, the next solution. Just give me a minute, it seems to flow here. Is to look at creating an elevated path. And that's subject to a long, as long as there is no overland so, uh, flow paths required under the building footprints. So in this case, you basically get people to walk along the active edge. So you sort of create a raised footpath along the edge of the building, looking at a minimum 1.8 meter circulation. So these are work in progress con controls and how to deal with it. Others are looking at uh, where the level is not very high. Uh, how do you go and deal with it? This could be an approach. And in cases where it's over one and a half meters in certain cases, uh, then how do you deal with it? So we thought maybe it could be an opportunity just to put a mic or something like that. That is a sacrificial bit, whereas most of, uh, you know, the retail edges, the most of the other stuff could be located on a high ground. Now, this is an extreme case scenario, does not happen everywhere. But this is basically to allow more ease of movement from the footpath into the retail or shop areas, ground for shop areas. In terms of residential, it's a bit different, but the whole idea is that if the flood uh, uh, plane planning level is less than one and a half meters, it's a possibility to have a front garden and a common property where you can plant some trees and have the first six meters, five meters of deep soil. But if it is higher than that, uh, then we are looking at uh, possibly the first, all the front setback being on deep soil and on common property. This is an example of how does basement ramps work, especially if you're trying to transition people off the footpath into a higher flood planning level. So you have to go up to come down. So that makes it tricky. So you not only are you have to have a very long ramp to get down into the basement, but also in case it floods, it becomes a very expensive affair to clean up. So it begs the question: Can you actually have above ground car parking that are sleeved with other users as an approach to go ahead and say? And this is the Auckland flood uh, design manual looks at sleeving of car parks, multi-story sleeving of car parks. So the lower podium level basically has car parks behind the yellow bit, but you can see, and above it is the residential tower, which goes ahead. So it is, you have to be creative, but the advantage is that you get most of your uh, basement car parking out of a very expensive basement above ground. And second is with more transport capacity or the dependence of on-site car parking, you could actually repurpose those into commercial as long as the flow, flow heights are, are uh, adequate. Like if you're keeping four meter floor to floor instead of your two and a, uh, uh, three meters for uh, car parking, you would be able to go ahead and repurpose it for other users, large or plate commercial. Next is key resilient measures. Again, uh, I mentioned that before, this is uh, a development in Parramatta uh, looking at uh, the tower on Church Street, the same thing looking at heat island mapping of it, and quite a few cities are doing it, and it's actually relatively accessible technology to get an understanding of where the heat island is, and how do you respond to it. So this is relatively easy to roll out, that would be one of the first thing to do. Next is providing adequate urban tree canopy cover to go ahead and minimize the heat, idea, uh, heat impacts. 
third, shading and passive energy techniques to be used, uh, whether in prioritizing natural ventilation, creating lightweight shading structures. The use of cool roofs and materials, again, it's new science going and saying that you can have materials that reflect, does not absorb the sun's heat and reflect most of it away. So therefore, gaining less heat in, in, in peak summer. And last is green roofs and walls. Again, there's a lot of hype about it. I'll talk about it later. Uh, again, in order to build resilience, heat resilience is to first invest in tree canopy cover and look at you know what are how do you manage to do it and have a strategy in place and this is a slide of Parramatta is one of the suburban areas it's easy to do it there but if this uh, suburb were to redevelop I think it would be very important to maintain that stand of trees to go ahead and identify where those trees are because if you say okay we're going to cut them down and plant twice the amount of trees that'll take 30 years to get that capacity up but you have it ready right now. So the first thing is retain what is good. And that should be a philosophy that goes in into any kind of development. And that conversation, that strong conversation is needed with the development pressures that we cannot afford to lose whatever vegetation we have right now in lieu of trees in the future, because often that we don't know whether it's going to be delivered. Second, whether they'll survive to maturity. So keep what you have bought. Uh, quite a few uh, Cities. This is the Dallas Urban Heat Management Strategy, which has gone ahead and uh, is in Texas oil country. They have gone ahead and invested in that uh, heat management strategy. So I think it is something that is needed to be because the trees are the smartest way to reduce heat island effect. So making sure that co-located trees, shared canopy cover, and also looking at aspects of soil health and nutrition and what's there. So I'm not a landscape architect, but there. It's very important to have that conversation early on with the landscape uh, designers and and uh, having arborists into the conversation, preparing street master plans, etc. Looking at traditional urbanism, uh, you know, this again in Amdabad, this is the traditional pole, which are basically merchant guilds who stay together, so work, stay, you know, they, there was this mixed use precinct, but they were essentially homogenous as a community and they could be easily gated off and made into a, a you know pretty much a pedestrian enclave you do have motorcycles and small carts and lorries but not too much for car movement and uh by because of the narrow spaces and mutual shading it creates a lot of cool microclips in a hot dry climate it's quite effective but if you're looking at contemporary urbanism, it's very different. There's Parramatta Square downtown. And whether we like it or not, there's a lot of glass, no matter non-reflective glass or otherwise, a significant amount of glass, very large buildings, very exposed buildings with a lot of wind down drafts, etc. So it is important to consider what is uh, what works for uh, modern spaces. And one of the important things is life on the ground. And this is uh, again a uh, draft controls that Paramatta is working on, looking at the ability of creating a street wall that is lower in scale and the tower setback, six meters minimum. So any wind down draft is broken by these podiums. And that creates a more comfortable scale where you can get better separation of buildings and therefore trees have a better opportunity to get daylight and, uh, you know, the heat island effect is also mitigated more because of it. So you're not getting a, an unpleasant uh, environment at the ground or, or, or mi mitigating it. At least. And urban heat island is dependent on the sky view factor. It is something that is obviously becoming quite a topical issue is effectively how much space is there between building for that heat to dissipate. So cr dense crowded environments with towers cheek by jowl is going to create a more urban heat island. So putting that some legislation or controls in place is important. Now, green roofs and walls I mentioned before, like it is very expensive to do and it requires a lot of maintenance. So if it is a high budget program or that someone is championing it to the right, left is uh, a building in Zurich, Switzerland. I think it's green. Uh, is green wall into some kind of a parking facility and a cultural facility 
and the Chicago Town Hall is the, uh, the, uh, the garden on the roof. Again, both of them have a very different agenda to say private development and very high end uh, projects are going to invest in it. But what we have found in our experience that if a uh, green wall is expensive to maintain, after a while, if it gets too expensive, people basically put an application, can we remove it? So it just becomes a wasted effort. So you're seen to go ahead and give some environmental capacity and then you take it away because it's too expensive to maintain. So put in things that are resilient, sometimes just a pergola, you know, that it provides shade in summer and sun in winter, deciduous vine. And to the right is the Milona's building, the Cabuzia, which looks at the Brie de Soleil and repurposes it, part of his original design with planters so that get some greenery into facades, but conventional means so it doesn't need very fancy hardware. You could go ahead and green a building and create that, the, the green factor that we talk about. Also cool roofs and walls. Traditionally, it was done by whitewash, mainly in Santorini in Greece and uh, Jodhpur and a few other cities, which tends to use white as a reflective element. And uh, this is white roof housing in Bermuda. Uh, but it's the new material science has got different colors, which actually are cool. So this is a developing area of material science. And again, I mentioned about shading devices. In this case, a lightweight aluminum shading devices are used. If you use concrete instead, the concrete would have retained heat all through the day and at night released in back into the unit. So aluminum heats up quickly possibly but dissipates it quickly so it's important to use the right element for shading devices looking at urban resilience uh, i'd like to showcase uh, singapore again a lot of cities have master plans but singapore has actually stuck to it since 1959 and one of the things that was a common theme going through is importance of water like singapore has poor uh, access to portable water sources they basically ship a uh, pipe in the water from Malaysia, uh, process it, filter, filter it, and consume some of it and sends the rest back to Malaysia. But it all requires Malaysia to turn off the taps and they are exposed. So they have gone ahead into a lot of effort that, that permeates the way of water management and all, all levels of uh, design and, and planning and governance. And it looks at how do you go ahead and harvest rainwater down to more effective use in high rise buildings. And the other thing that they have invested is riparian restoration, Bishan Park, where a, a, a straight culverted uh, creek was gone ahead, restored into a wetland, which has become an urban park. So they have use the same throughout the other was the marina water barrage which looked at the saltwater estuary and then uh, basically harvest the water for 10 years into this pump out the salt water and fill it with gradually over time with fresh water creating short-term uh, water security for for the for the city now measures for climate change resilience uh, this is a bit wordy so i will try to not bore you this is, I've just done an ideas dump of every possible uh, strategy that could be considered in terms of the four key themes, urban heat island, flood, drought, and fire hazard. The first, of course, urban heat island. I think it is important to incentivize or mandate cool roofs and paving materials. Now in New South Wales last week, they mandated the use of, you know, cool roofs in Western Sydney where the temperature is very high. And there was an outcry by the developing developer community and saying, no, that is going to make not not OK. They said two things, make your backyards large enough to grow a tree or use, you know, do not use dark colored tiles on your roof. And both actually make sense. And there's no reason to go ahead and get so angry about it. Yes, it might drive up the cost a little bit, but if the people are serious about making a change, I think small things like this will effectively use change. So sometimes draconian controls do have their role. So it can start off small things like this. As I mentioned before, uh, use, uh, use appropriate cost-effective heat mitigation measures. A pergola sometimes with a deciduous endemic vine is more effective than a rooftop garden, which is far more expensive and prone to leaks. 
uh, passive solar techniques and uh, uh, courtyards acting as cool tanks are effective to three to eight story scale. Beyond that, it tends to, you know, it doesn't work as effectively. I think mutual shading, depot, masonry walls, recessed windows are good. So the conventional wisdom that we had in our design education, that still works at the lower levels. At the upper levels, however, the sky view factor is important, and I think that needs to be acknowledged. So essentially, more space between high rise towers for dispersal of heat gain, heat gain is needed, and also looking at lightweight shading uh, devices on affected facades, say western facades, where increased high, high heat gain is likely. Again, this sounds like common sense, but heat generating sources like HVAC systems, split units, where do people put it? In the balconies. Now, if you are putting it on the balcony, you can't use the balcony because there's a hot blast of hot air in when the room is getting chilled inside. So effectively, it requires you to be inside. So if that heat is located somewhere, so a centralized location, this requires a little bit of consideration in light of what's happening with COVID, how does AC work, but not locating it the most obvious location. For the developer, it makes sense to locate in the balcony, not from a climate science point of view. And lastly, cooling devices in the public domain, whether shade structures, uh, drinking water bubblers, misting devices, and water play parks, consider investing them because they will actually give immediate relief in the short term. Uh, in terms so of- one, Excuse me, sir, we have one uh, over our time limit. So- uh, Okay, time I'm nearly time. done. I'm nearly okay. done. Just, uh, I'll probably be done in five. So uh, looking at heat island mitigation, retain enhanced tree canopy has spoken about it before. Uh, maintain deep contiguous salt zones, engage with landscape architects and arborists early on, and avoid monoculture and plant for tackle planting as tree species so that you do not have all trees dying out at the same time. In terms of flood resilience, I've gone through it in quite a lot of detail earlier. Protect environmentally sensitive land, which is such as wetlands, ground aquifers, and creek corridors. Do not culvert drainage systems anymore. That's a fairly dated way of dealing with uh with water movement identify where choke points and bottlenecks are to prevent floods and do not allow changes to existing ground level without flood modeling in place and uh where you are putting in deep soil areas consider opportunity for flood resilient ground cover and flood storage capacity and if you are accommodating people you know, in case of emergency rescue, there's a shelter in place consideration. You can take a look at it. Uh, I'll provide a copy of the presentation. And in terms of drought, drought looking at rain mandating measures like rainwater har harvesting and gray water recycling and more sensitive urban design. Water is more topical in areas like uh, Australia. It's not necessarily a problem everywhere, but looking at managing adjoining grassland and forest ecologies, uh, mapping risks and probable fire parks, disaster evacuation plans, things like do not allow color sacks because they, if there's a burning tree falling across the main exit out, people don't have any way to go out. And uh, lastly, looking at mandating risk mitigation measures like dam reservoirs, etc. And this is one project I'll skip over the case studies uh, more importantly is that if we are going to work on climate resilience, the first thing is that it is most effective, it is legislated. But if it's legislated, it doesn't necessarily mean the outcomes are going to be good because they often tend to be value engineered. So I think it is important to formally acknowledge in the scope of briefs of any planning and design exercise. So that it's there for everyone to see, it's costed up front and there is the right set of professionals to deliver it. It's not done as incidental and non-programmed inclusion, but that often, you know, it might be okay for non-programmed uh, spaces. You can have a pop-up cart here and an amphitheater here, etc. I think it needs to be more serious that you do need to go and put your money where your mouth is and actually work out what the outcomes are. So they're measurable targets and it is costed up and using the science, technology, and know-how you have at the moment you plan for it. Lastly, uh, the impact of the proposed measures should be looked at, evaluated. It shouldn't be about the mere optics of it. A lot of people say, let's put a few solar panels in. But 
solar panels are not very effective in inner density environment or, or in cloudy weather. So having a gray water, black water recycling is far more effective in an inner, inner city environment than you know, solar panels. So looking at these are important. So I think that's pretty much it. I'm sorry I went over time and uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Oh, thank you very much, um, sir. It was a very enlightening presentation and a detailed one. Um, thank you also uh, for to our audience for bearing with us during our technical difficulties and helping us uh, to attend to those as well. Uh, now it is my pleasure to invite, uh, uh, to introduce our two moderators. First, we have landscape architect, Esther Basnaker with us, who is a founding member and the first president of the Institute of Landscape Architects. Uh, she's also a guest, lecture, uh, guest lecturer at the University of Moratua, uh, and is also presently uh, an architectural consultant in Sri Lanka. Then we have the urban designer, planner, architect Priya Silva with us. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience in architectural planning and building industry. He received his master's in urban planning from Oxford University. He was past president of the Institute of Town Planners, Sri Lanka, fellow member of SLIA, and is now the managing director of Advocacy Private Limited. Uh, since we have uh, gone over time due to various reasons, uh, we would make uh, first take one question from each moderator, though we were supposed to take two questions. And afterwards, uh, we will open the forum to the, uh, the question time with the forum. Uh, audience can pose their questions in the chat, uh, which we would direct later. Uh, so first, over to uh, Madam uh, Hester Baznaika. Hello. Hello. Plan PL, can you start? Uh, yes. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chandra, it's a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, my uh, first uh, question to you is now on this. Uh, eco-sensitive uh, res responses, especially for flood prone areas and uh, where you, know, you, you were dealing with water related disasters and the design responses, you covered a wide uh, range of responses and uh, various uh, mitigatory measures. I, my question is, in a situation where you have uh, land tenure uh, very fragmented, uh, what is the length of government intervention required in order to get this kind of uh, ecosystem protected while allowing developments to take place? Because we have a very regulatory system, but uh, parallelly we have a uh, um, very fragmented land uh, tenureship, which uh, creates a lot of problems in implementing this kind of uh, projects and uh, responses. So in your opinion, what would be the government intervention should be in order to get a project of this nature in place? That, thank you for your question. That is a very, very topical question all over the world, actually. And uh, one of the things that we find, a lot of successful places you know, are the ones that with the smaller tenures. They have the ones with smaller shops. They tend to be quite vibrant. They have a lot of range of users. The problem is not actually keeping the status quo. It's the problem is when those tenures are seeking to go and develop into something that is you know, they wanted to go ahead with a much higher level of development than what can be accommodated on the site. So I think the short term arrangement was that the existing rights prevail. You can continue to do whatever your tenure allows you to do. But if you are seeking higher levels of development, then you have to basically either consolidate or basically make sure that you're compliant with 
the higher levels of development. So anything with the scale of an addition and alteration, you're allowed. But the moment you're going into something that I'm putting in a six story building out there, then you have to actually comply with whatever the new regulations are. So I think it should be a two stage approach. So that allows the existing thing to come continue till the, the, you know, the shelf life of the building is obviously gone and there is enough you know, the real estate potential has basically made it worthwhile for someone to acquire all those lands to redevelop it with the new standards. That would be in an ideal world, but it's tricky because most people hold out and don't want to sell. So the point is, if you don't want to sell, if you don't want to go down that, you want it, your existing rights remain. There's no one is telling you you can't have you what you have. But if you're trying to go ahead and get more and say the maximum potential of development on your land, then you have to follow with the new guidelines. That would be my approach. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yes, yes. I, 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 yeah. we, we have this uh, issue all over the place because most of these wetlands and environmentally sensitive areas, we have this problem. Government is uh, defining certain percentage of development. But when it comes to real implementation, it's very difficult to enforce. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I agree that we need to have some sort of consolidation or acquisition in right. order to create the, at least the, the basic. Uh, the other thing that uh, may be possible, which is not necessary, it needs a lot of organization on the part of the government authority, is because a lot of people feel disadvantaged. They feel that they are not getting what everyone, someone else is getting more than them that's their feeling that it's not fair so if a larger plan is being prepared then consider something like land banking where everybody consolidates and becomes a, a stakeholder depending on the volume of land you own and at the end of the day you get a return based on the perceived value of the land at the end of the day and you get a proportion value so everybody doesn't get equally you get it based on what you have but there is a certain sense of fairness because there's a system in place but it requires a very strong government authority who basically forms a consortium with the private sector and okay. has a, a very transparent system in place. And uh, then not to be successful, okay. example, it can be done. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, my... uh, architect Piazilla, do you have any other questions for uh, architect Amitai Chowdhury? Hello? Hello. Hello, yes. Uh, do you have any other questions for architect uh, Amitav Chaudhry? Yeah, my um, uh, other concern was, you know, how, how to get uh, people harnessed into this process as a voluntary involvement or commitment, because most of these uh, solutions were designer led, but mm -hmm. uh, how, how to get the community involved into this process so that it uh, maintains the sustainability of the development in the long term. Is there any um, experience that you have in getting these communities more involved into these situations? Look, uh, at least from a governance point of view, nobody wants their land impacted. That's the first thing, the, the re response is that, no, I don't want it, just let me alone. And especially if it impacts their livelihood, or a future potential if there's a loss of value, perceived loss of value. So uh, the first thing that is there is, of course, having transparency in what we are doing. And as I said, having a system that seems appears fair. If it seems that consultation is being done for lip service, that that's one of the failures I've noticed that people tend to distrust any form of thing where they believe that the consultation is a is a you know, it's a, you know, it's a foregone conclusion that you're being asked after the decision has been made. So I think it's important to approach them, but actually have a clear strategy because most of consultations tend to be a bit more about the optics of it. At least this is my experience around here and I'm talking individually, not as that representative. So a lot of the time, if people see that you are being sincere and there is a clear path of how you get it. So as I said, land banking is one of them, if there's somebody willing to go and do it, or having some equitable remuneration system in place so that everybody knows what they're going to get. There is no guessing game. This is where it is. 
if somebody decides to negotiate separately and that's where things fall apart. So I think that level of consistency is important. Uh, as I said, it is more, it re really works if the state has a property arm in that case to help them with it. If it is being done by mainstream bureaucrats, it tends to become tricky because their role is not in this position of negotiating. So have a separate property arm within a state organization that can deal with it actually helps because they are specialists and they know how to do it better. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chowdhury. It was very uh, enlightening and entertaining uh, session. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think Hester, uh, uh, landscape architect, uh, uh, can just... you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Right, I managed to come back. I uh, there was some. I lost it. There could be various reasons. Anyway, it, it was a much wider scope that was covered in, in your very interesting talk than I originally expected. And I'm glad about that. Um, I am not going straight into a question, but also to say that um, in many urban areas, but not all, in Sri Lanka, there is the possibility of compulsory acquisition. Um, but depends on the area. As you say, there are protests from people, but there are certain um, areas where they could, there's, in the past, there has been relocation in a better setup, free mm -hmm. from flooding, for example. Right. And uh, the, one example is also the area around the Sri Lankan parliament, where wetlands have been uh, uh, some have been converted in, uh, made even to more watery wetlands by making them into lakes, and right. some have been kept as marshy areas. Right. And uh, uh, fortunately, that area wasn't. Um, uh, I am not sure exactly what the as right at the beginning what the population living there was, but there was there were large areas which were not populated. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there has been a certain amount of convincing that uh, relocation is needed of populations and to better uh, conditions and using mm -hmm. these as parks, cum flood retention areas. Right. Um, it's, uh, what, um, in such cases, I, I'm not sure how it would work in a place like Australia. Would mm -hmm. people be open in in uh, it varies in different countries i suppose to being relocated to a better situation it, it is very difficult to convince even though they are already suffering with flood right you see uh, what is the situation in places like australia look i can give you a little bit more of a perspective about uh, say an urban area of australia where the key issue right now the last decade has been remarkable in the amount of real estate speculation that's happening so it is not often the the low you know the low density and the agricultural uses that are impacting uh you know the shape of cities it is sheer amount of speculation when a 3000 square meter plot of land goes for 60 million dollars on speculation it just completely drives every single design value out of the water. And I think, I think what needs to be looked at is if it is, how big is the impact? Because if you're talking about people speculating on fringe urban land and putting in very high density development, that's where I think it should be. There should be a moratorium on first, you know, above all, do no harm kind of approach that you're not making the situation worse. So putting in some statutory controls that prevent speculation on environmentally sensitive land, that would be the start. But if you're looking at, okay, someone is there, it's been a farmer and going and farming around there and sort of, it is still, uh, you know, risks prone or it is a low level settlement. I think that has to be, uh, the approach would have to be a little bit different from the high rise development. So I think the approach is 
it's really trying to make sure that speculation does not happen out there. That would be, and it does sometimes, this is a non-design question. It goes out of the hands of designers into people who are actually behind a, a lot of it. So it does need a lot of political will to prevent that. And whereas designers, we can convince them is to go ahead and lobby as guild groups and say that do not, for example, in the case of Calcutta, do not go ahead and allow any more development in, in a wetland area. And uh, sometimes it has, you have to resort to things like making it a World Heritage Area, et cetera. But that's a secondary issue because other people are impacted. But I think that was the thing. To minimize speculation, if you address the money, a lot of the short-term issues can be sorted. But that is a very tough game because a lot of the, the, the people who are behind in a lot of the real estate are the ones that have a lot of political reach and that becomes a bit tricky. One of the measures which helps is in the uh, urban development plans, that is, is in urban areas, of course, yes. in the urban uh, declared urban development areas, there is zoning and, they, and those areas like that are, are zoned in mm -hmm. such a way that you cannot develop them, you see. Okay. So uh, that is one of the tools that uh, I think most countries have to, yeah. for the, by, by the zoning to say this is suitable for such and such users only. Then right. the, the people there might be willing to uh, sell the land to the government in yeah. order to do the necessary modifications to it right. as, as, it, uh, for, as a park which can withstand uh, various, especially flooding right. is right. the most uh, uh, common thing there. Again, the, the solution sometimes may be in statutory legislation, planning legislation. Uh, around here, there is a system of existing users, like if you are, uh, say, a metal workshop in a residential area, uh, because of existing users, uh, you may be allowed to continue. But the moment you want to upgrade and say, I want to put in better facilities or, you know, put in a second floor, that's where effectively your existing use expire because you cannot change what you have given. And sooner or later, it sort of basically makes it uh, not worthwhile to go and continue trading there so that way zoning principles work so if there's something that's not permitted temporarily you can go ahead and as an existing use so a similar approach can be taken with uh with aspects like planning where you're trying to do it the second is also looking at where uh, it could be done as if the land is large enough if there's a large landowner so there is a certain amount of dedication in lieu of development or part payment or some kind of arrangement. So that's why I think a state property wing is useful because it uh, they actually have the know-how and the ability to negotiate with people that normal bureaucrats don't. So this is something that uh, I think can help. Uh, looking at, I would imagine, Sri Lanka would have a similar governance structure to, uh, to India. And India has a very different approach, it's either it's either lethargy that's too hard, we won't do it, or it is draconian, they, they send the bulldozers in, there's nothing in between. So it tends to become a bit tricky uh, either way. So one, nothing happens. The other one is it's happening at a cost of a lot of people getting hurt financially or otherwise. And in Australia, I think they have the middle way with that, the property arm comes in. That being said, uh, you know, it, it tends to be very different because Western democracies have a lot of forces of lobbying going on in there. So it isn't as transparent as we would like it to imagine. But somehow the other uh, the environment is very much in the eye of the media. And that is the other role where media can play a very, a very contributory role of highlighting issues that if something is going wrong, they are able to bring it to the fore and there is of of course, questions asked in Parliament, etc. So it goes ahead. It's a balance, I think. Uh, I think India is on a learning curve right now, and I I hope Sri Lanka is in a better position than where India is at the moment. So. Uh, just one more quick question. In in uh, Sri Lanka, we have many areas where we uh, there is a. A resistance to allowing enough reservations in land development for roads with adequate space to plant trees mm -hmm. and also for the space around buildings to be adequate enough to plant 
even one tree in the, the latest uh, urban development regulation will mm -hmm. um, not even be enough for that with the amount of uh, uh, building that it allows. Yeah. The, there are other things like that. And when um, we, the landscape architects, come into conflict with the urban planners because uh, they say, oh, you, uh, there are actually some, not obviously, certain people who say you're going against human rights, trying to zone areas in such a way that you, you can uh, acquire their land for public open space, which will be climate resilient spaces, right? open right. spaces. Right. But the fact is that in the long run, people have to understand that we even, it's not just large spaces, even that additional little strip, we, we, we have got to do it. We have to uh, make the urban development regulations. At this moment, we're actually trying to improve the regulations to ensure yes. that those strips are kept along roads, around yes. buildings for the tree, yes. because that is something we have just got to do. We, we face agree? a similar dilemma here. We face a similar dilemma here because uh, on one hand, you know, there is a desire to go and increase tree canopy cover. So a resolution made is we need 14% more trees in the next however many years. On the other hand, the legislation basically in the city center has can allow in a mixed use building with commercial and other basement pool, 100% ground coverage. So there's no room for trees. So what I think uh, we have come to a conclusion is that identify where trees may be located and you know decide and say there are some areas some streets where we will go ahead and put it in so it has to be done opportunistically unfortunately it cannot be done on all streets and open spaces and uh, the whole idea is be like some concessions are given so if you are providing say a six meter strip of land that allows a large canopy tree so you will be given a little bit of concession in some aspects of it. So the, the regulation allows for that. It's some kind of a negotiated outcome. So the tree provision is considered as a public good benefit, and therefore you put it. Like a lot of state roads in, uh, in, in, uh, in Sydney proper don't have room for trees. So all the trees you can happen is on the private domain or outside the trail road corridor. So. When we encountered this, I said, it's anyways a busy road. You are not going to have shops opening out onto the busy road, or it's not ideal, or they probably will not do thriving trade. Why don't you set your buildings aside to allow for the trees? And that will be considered in lieu of some other concession that you can. So it is a bit of a negotiated outcome, and we are trying very hard, but it is an uphill battle. And as I said, I'm talking from the point of an architect, and I understand why they're saying it, because to get those densities in place, they need large footprints and it comes at a cost and trees are the first things to be sacrificed but it is long-term damage we are doing you're right okay uh, thank you very thank much you. Uh, thank you for the questions and answers uh, i think since the time is now uh, moving fast that we have to look at few uh, these chat questions yeah. uh, is appeared here so i think um, here there's one uh, it's a comment rather from Dr. Pisalienege, he's an engineer, and uh, it's questioning about, you know, we have been lost and forgotten that we are living in tropical country, and in many ways, that even the buildings, uh, you know, the same to the question that uh, landscape architect Basnaik uh, <coughs> uh, asked, uh, so the building space in between and so on. So yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know, as a as a, as a fact that you know we uh, are done very much good in water management in historically in ancient times if you look right. at many of our cities are based on water you know water is a source of uh, living and uh, everything so mm -hmm. um, we, are, we are engineering on these areas uh, landscape uh, architecture engineering land utilization will uh, will show that um, how much we are keen on those but somehow uh, this has been lost during the recent time, even like, you know, very recently we heard or we have seen some uh, pictures uh, going around that uh, front area of the Kalamu Municipal Bill, uh, sorry, Museum Building, uh, which is uh, more than 150 years of old historical monument with the context uh, well kept uh, for uh, such a long time, but that mm -hmm. has been cleared uh, for uh, paving. 
the whole area. So therefore, these are the, uh, you know, it's still, you know, things that we retain uh, are mm -hmm. unable to uh, uh, kept uh, or maintain. Uh, right. The question before I uh, ask from uh, this audience, um, mm -hmm. uh, if you could uh, explain that now, uh, I know that the experience that I had in North America, where uh, this, uh, you know, this water uh, management and all is coming from the planning and the development approval uh, process at the very beginning. Right. Uh, one of the issues with our context is that our planning approval, unless uh, if it is a mega or big project, uh, yeah. small scale buildings and even houses and you know small commercial buildings, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that still uh, there's a proper way of looking at this water management, uh, the surface water drain and you know how all these are connected to the next drain and so on like now yeah. what you showed from mm -hmm. your city, uh, what, mm -hmm. what we, are, we are working now, uh, it simplifies very well that uh, you have to have a you know big uh, or you have to have a proper mapping uh, yeah. system uh, of yeah. uh, you know it has to be considered as a system right where yeah. we are we are trying to look at you know just uh, wherever the lower land and where there's an existing canal right. or something there that we try to uh, divert the right. road but but it has to be right. worked out as a very well system is it applied uh, during the uh, you know basic planning approval process like in North America in, in Canada and so on like you know they, they uh, strictly look at the, even for a small project that uh, how yeah. this water is connected to the uh, other water management right. system yes thank you for the question yes they do look at the, there it is fairly legislated it's very clear what they have to look at but what they're looking for is rather like what architects and designers, of my generation look at were trained to look at environmental comfort in our case so they are looking at uh, water management flows etc from a very uh you know it is a, a bit not really geared for climate rather than looking at to make sure that the people are not going ahead and are doing their share for you know a better effective stormwater uh, treatment and management so it is legislated it does go ahead and does not make things worse in most cases uh, most of it is very engineered and uh uh you know it's fairly very clear that you have to get in a point uh, uh, a consultant to go ahead and do the the numbers it's submitted the drawings are proposed it's stamped and it has to be built along with the rest of the development but as you mentioned piecemeal and hope that all the sum total of the piecemeal will address a bigger issue of climate. What I'm contending is it isn't because it's not looking at the other aspects of outside the individual development area. Sometimes it is really entire catchments which are not being looked at. So I think what is needed, I think it's across the globe, is having that knowledge or open source information, whether it is done with the government grant or whatever it is, but it is set up. Uh, there is a GIS data with all that information and people have access to it just as some kind of a guidance system that we are aware that if you are investing in a plot of land around here, it has high hydraulic hazard, inappropriate for a hospital. So something as basic as that needs to be flagged off well before you go to the development engineer. And that is where that analysis and mapping and uh, you know bringing in the urban resilience is important. So while I do acknowledge that they do a better job than probably in my experience what happens in Southeast Asia, but it does not quite address the needs for the the extensive need of looking at the whole city as an organism. And I think that is what is needed right now. There it has to be a discussion from the realm of the individual site and individual developments into a sum total of the city to look at some kind of dynamic modeling. And it cannot be done at the realm of the individual. Nobody has a capacity. So the state has to make it their state or local government has to make it their business. So yes, it, what you're saying is needed as a first stage that you have to create detention bases, you have to cre create on-site detention, you have to create water harvesting system, and you hope that all of this will lead to the greater good. But unless you have a bigger framework in place, it really has to be top, to, top down and bottom upwards approach, and they have to meet somewhere in the middle, if you know what I mean.
Yeah, thank you, Amitabh. Uh, now there's one more question here from Champal Yenegi. Cool yeah. roofs, white, may cool the inside of the building, how it affects to the environment when it reflects heat? Yeah. Look, the sun's energy, if it's going to be in, once it enters an atmosphere, it is going to be there in the atmosphere. The question is, if it's not a cool roof, it's going to enter that bill form and radiate at, at night in an urban area. Now, if it gets reflected back, yes, ambient temperature may go up, but the problem is if you absorb it and release it at night, effectively you're creating heat stress through the day and night in an urban area. So it would be better to go ahead and have the cool roof. And yes, some of it will be released back into the atmosphere, but it's going to be released back into the atmosphere. And again, what we are saying is it's better released during the day than it collected at the night and released at le leisure. And so you heat up the nights as well. So it's important just from you know, the question of um, uh, in environment. I'm just talking about heat gain and loss. So it is important to use cool roofs. And they need not be white. That's what I'm saying. The white was a traditional way of making cool roofs. You can get a lot of new material science. Can, can you get you a different colored, uh, you know, roof finishes where you can actually have uh, road surfaces which are not necessarily black asphalt, but different colored, but that actually does not gain. So it's important to use that. It doesn't have to be on roofs as well. It can be on paved plazas. On, on any surfaces, instead of using, uh, you know, a, a, a black, a dark metal roof, if you put that metal, material, it becomes a lot cooler. So. Okay, yes. Um, thank you. Um, the Madhu Mali, I think we can now uh, slowly. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so now let's have the uh, water tanks for the uh, of the Institute of Urban Designers, architect uh, Pradeep Fernando. Uh, Madhubali, could you go ahead with the next item? So since uh, the... Yes, uh, next item is uh, uh, water of tanks by the secretary of the Institute of Urban Designers, architect Pradeep Fernando. Hello. Pradeep, uh, are you there? Pradeep, are you there? Yes, Pradeep, uh, we can't hear you. Hello, Pradeep. Architect Pradeep. I don't think he's there. Uh, he's there, I can see him, but... Uh... Okay. Um... <clears throat> I think uh, let's conclude the event. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I tried to uh, do this final thing for Pradeep. Um, so once again, um, uh, Amitabh Chaudhary, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was very informative as said that um, it was very elaborated and also taking uh, us into different continents, different cities, and uh, you touched that all topic very well and uh, thanks uh, thank you very much uh, for assisting us with us uh, and also our moderators uh, landscape architect uh, Hester Basnaik uh, urban design architect and Pial Silva thank you both of you for coming uh, and uh, uh, contributing to the event uh, and uh, also uh, all the participants uh, this time uh, we had uh, architect Ashley Divorce uh, uh, we could not talk to him anyway, um, but hopefully uh, next time, at the time that this is time, we are very sorry about the 
beginning that there's a issue uh, with us as well and then amitabh and uh, but anyway um, uh, we hope that um, it was all right that we could manage with the time uh, and uh, so uh, once again like uh, we thank uh, all the participants that we we see that now there's a lot of uh, growing participants uh, uh, group here and uh, not only architects and urban uh, designers but also uh, engineers um, you know environmentalists and uh, and so on uh, and uh, we thank to the team who worked for this uh, our council members as well as the core team of the urban talks uh, session uh, and uh, and also we thank to the um, all the uh, other architecture and also planning design schools uh, where some of the um, teachers uh, lecturers as well as the uh, administrative uh, heads were there uh, and thank you for coming and also uh, you know um, <clears throat> uh, maybe um, bringing your students uh, so um i think um i have uh thanked all of you and uh, so until we see next time so next month uh, we are talking about uh, uh turkey uh, one of the uh, uh, i think this uh, uh, the capital city um some uh, urban design projects and also Uh, some interesting aspect about uh, that context so thank you uh, until uh, we see next time uh, stay safe and uh, good night to all of you thank you thank you thank you for having thank me it was a pleasure Anwar, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much again thank you good night everybody good night thank you thank you bye thank you bye bye thank you thank you